Hello, everyone. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, open decentralization models for web-free gaming. And uh, my name is uh, Łukasz Szymański. I'm on a mission to decentralize the future as an alternative to the current solutions that we can see in the world. And uh, I'm the father of two and founder and CEO of Tokenomia Pro, which is a web-free consulting and blockchain development company. I have a 10 years of experience in um, the technology industry, six years as a manager, where as a director of engineering, I built and managed teams in OLX Group, which is a network of uh, classifieds across the world with over 300 million people every month. And I have completed many courses at different universities, including Harvard Business Review, uh, Harvard Business School, and also I'm a lecturer in uh, universities in Poznań and Warsaw regarding the blockchain itself, and I'm the local host for Token Engineering Academy. Also, I'm a gamer. Uh, in a previous life when I had time, obviously, but uh, yeah, this is this is how it works. So when it comes to the games, I have my top favorite three, which is, uh, first of all, it's uh, God of War. The second one is uh, Civilization. And the third one, my favorite one, is Rayman. I didn't manage to like do all of the uh, treasuries, but I uh, didn't have time for that. But anyway, uh, we will go back to one of these games later when we will try to implement some of the web-free uh, build building blocks in already existing games. So going back to the model itself, uh, first we are going to start to actually compare between Web 2 and Web 3. And with that, I would like to show you how it differs and that when it comes to game, it's not only about the blockchain. The blockchain is only one building block that um, actually is only a more like enabler for doing a lot of interesting stuff with games than the, uh, like the building block itself that you can uh, expand and really leverage uh, directly. So when I'm referring to Web2, it's basically referring to the uh, typical um, technical stack where besides of uh, gaming engines like Unity or Unreal Engine, um, you have obviously users, which are gamers. Then the front-end layer is the game itself, which, which can be web browser game, uh, mobile game, or PC game. Then the game itself is uh, connecting with the backend. And the backend is, of course, servers. It can be like cloud servers. It can be in-house servers. But still, it's uh, centralized and under control of, of the company. And the backend is storing the data, and which previously applied like business logic, processing of this data, and data aggregation. And it's stored in the database. With all of that, like part of this data is user data, which is uh, the, really important and we'll get back to it also later why well later why is it so important and on the end of the day obviously companies want to make money right on top of the games so also in order to de de defense the business model everything that is basically possible is encapsulated in the proprietary intellectual property so basically the companies want to have exclusive rights to everything that is happening on their, on their service, on their game, etc. Uh, which is a totally different model than how web free model works with full decentralization. Of course, like users, gamers are the same. But then when it comes to clients, the clients is also the interface through which the user is interacting with the game. But here, the, the clients can be multiple. And actually, with web free model, um, it should be multiple clients that uh, gamers could interact with in order to have different experience based on the same uh, on the same engine we'll get back to it later then there is like smart contracts which is um, similar in uh, by design um, logical design to the back end meaning that smart contracts are responsible for business logic some uh, processing of the of the data and so on and at the end of the day we have also uh, user data but the user data here is fully owned and controlled by the users. Uh, no one, even if the company is uh, deploying the smart contracts, deploying different clients for the games, they are not in charge of the user data. And there are digital assets. And here is the most important part 
of all of the Web3 stack because comparing to the Web2 stack with digital assets and Web3, we have uh, one thing that we have, it's like a native form of payment, which we don't have in Web2. Because in Web2, in order to pay, you need to use some kind of third party provider like, for example, PayPal, right? In Web3, this is built in. Uh, the native payment, it's uh, the native token on the blockchain that you are using, like, for example, if on Ethereum. Then you also have other digital assets like uh, the tokens itself um, that can represent basically uh, whatever you will want. And we will uh, discuss about it in details in a couple of minutes. At the bottom, you can see the blockchain itself. And the blockchain, as I mentioned before, it's uh, not so important in terms of the mental models and the things that you can do, because it's more important from the fact that this is like infrastructure, this is where uh, the infrastructure layer, like comparing to the database to the Web2, and it's more like enabler. But when it comes to the blockchain itself, mm, I'm going to show you a quote that is connecting gaming industry with uh, decentralization whenever you like it or not. So some guy said, and we still don't know is it a true or more like urban legend, but there was a guy that said that uh, he happily played World of Warcraft and one day Blizzard removed the damage component from his uh, Warlock Siphon Life spell. And this guy really didn't like it. Uh, he basically went full mad. And the problem was that this guy was Vitalik Buterin, which is founder of Ethereum blockchain. And so, yeah, thank you, Blizzard, for that. Like, we really helped uh, because that was one of the motivation why Vitalik started to actually deep dive into uh, all of the decentralization stuff, uh, Bitcoin network, smart contracts, and so on and so on. So when we go back to these components of decentralized system, there are like three main themes that we always need to consider when we are designing some system around Web3. And these are three things like technical, economic, and legal. The technical stuff is, uh, as I mentioned with blockchain, this is an enabler. And it's enabler because uh, when you have possibility of bringing business logic that is autonomous and you can issue digital assets in whatever form you like, then you are enabling uh, your system to gain economic power. And with all of the new economic possibilities, like basically what you can do is you can deploy, deploy whatever economic system you would like and you can test it out which is not possible in real, real world at all. And at the end of the day, if there is economic value, then there is, of course, uh, legal stuff that you need to take care of, and some of the uh, regulations as well. When we are assessing such stuff, uh, this is like really high level still, but this shows you how many building blocks is possible to incorporate into the game. And again, it's not only about the blockchain itself. However, you can also still have some spectrum of different choices. There is also stuff about the uh, digital assets that you can use, which already exists. So there is no need from your side to actually issue anything. You can use already existing ones as an of, as some strategy of your um, hybrid approach to the Web3, where step by step you are introducing um, the new building blocks. Then there are different tokens, there are possibility of uh, decentralized governance, uh, even the partial one, meaning that, and I do think that decentralized governance is uh, one of the best bet for the gaming because the gaming is all about the communities and decentralized governance is about how communities are making decisions, how they are govern the assets under their control or maybe even the future of the, of the specific protocol. And there is also IP rights. So I've heard the previous panel discussion, plenty of talking about the IP rights, investments, and so on. So what you can do is also many different models around IP rights uh, who is going to have rights for what, under what conditions, which also is something innovative in web free space. And again, it's not only about the blockchain. What is happening right now in the web free industry, it's something called uh, token engineering. And as you can see, this is like interdisciplinary field of science. There are many researchers and many people like uh, entrepreneurs, funders, and so on that are uh, uh, included in that. And what, uh, what we are doing around it is uh, everything around designing the systems that um, actually work and are sustainable 
and it's uh, and they will work for a long time. So this is like community of people who are not interested in the cash grabs, are not interested in some pump and dump schemes, are interested in introducing the systems that uh, really can change the way we do some things right now online. What you can see here, it's uh, the full model of open decentralization. So comparing to the previous slide when I show you the different layers, here we can see that we have multiple clients and multiple uh, users. So in terms of gaming, how, how we can play with all of these like, building blocks? And again, I'm not even touching the, the blockchain at all. So when you look at the, the, the smart contract protocol layer, this is where, as an, for example, game developer, you can deploy a set of different smart contracts that other uh, game development studios could use, and automatically you can um, gather the uh, royalty fee from the volume of uh, usage. What you can also do, and of course the assumption here is that in Web3 everything is open sourced and everything is uh, open to whatever extension, whatever modification uh, as in opposite to, to the Web2 world. Then, what is important here, if you will be open to a Sun company, you can still have your own client that will be proprietary client operated by your company and you will have full rights for it. But then if you are open for developing totally new clients, uh, the gamers of the game, if they will choose to um, play through different client, uh, but still build in some components of your previous game, they will um, preserve the data, accomplishments, trophies, assets, and whatever they already gathered because of your game, uh, with, while playing with totally new experience on totally new client. Still, you can uh, make some fee on top of the fact that um, the other client was developed on top of your solution. What you can also do is you can actually um, deploy a token where the token itself will be governance token which will incentivize the clients to uh, develop totally new experiences and uh, reward them for, uh, for that. And this is what is really important here around, um, around the whole Web3 model, it's, it's the innovation pace that we are observing, especially right now it's happening in the decentralized finance space and it's happening because of the fact that everything is open, everyone can fork the solution, everyone can modify it, everyone can make money out of it. Uh, so it's, um, it enables the, the pace of the innovation that we, we really didn't see before at all. And if once gaming industry will start to adopt web free solution uh, even more because it already started and will be uh, um, aligned with the underlying guidelines around, hey, like be open source, don't, uh, um, don't protect it, everything you want under, uh, under your exclusive rights and so on, then this, this space of innovation is also um, uh, possible here. But then there is a question, okay, if I have like the development company and I'm going to like open source everything, share my know-how and so on, how I'm going to defend my business model? And this is the fair question. And the way how it works in Web3 is, uh, the, the, the answer for it is about the network effect. So here you can see so-called flywheel of the network effect when it comes to the layer one solutions in blockchain, which basically it's all about how blockchain is uh, defending, specific blockchains are defending their, their, their own business model, uh, even though they are fully open for um, uh, modifications and forking. So we have funders and core team that are creating the protocol, then they are issuing the token where the financial capital is coming in from investors in order to provide the initial financial value to incentivize miners or validators that are bringing the production capital, and this enables the platform functionality, right? So we have the infrastructure is in place. Then if infrastructure is in place, the 
uh, the third party developers are coming, bringing human capital and they're creating useful applications. The more useful applications we have, then there is more utility for end users. The more end users we have, there is uh, community coming in. The more community is around the specific solution, then uh, there is bigger value in the whole uh, network effect. And this, uh, this goes the, the way around. So this is, this is how it works and this is how it's uh, proven to work across many different uh, the blockchains, for example. Um, like one of the proof is um, that you can really frequently see that many of different protocols and blockchains are organizing different hackathons. They are doing the, this in order to incentivize the onboard uh, developers on their platform and incentivize them uh, um, on top of the fact that developers are creating some new useful applications on their solutions, not on the others. This is different uh, decentralization model. And as you can see, we have like um, multiple assets provider, multiple assets acquirer. And uh, it's, it's the model for tokenization protocols. So what you can see here, it can be basically also your uh, gaming asset marketplace in the Web3 model. Meaning that in this model, decentralization is achieved through diversity of the inputs, diversity of, um, of the demand side, which is acquires, and diversity of the clients. And what you can do, thanks to Web3, is you as an, for example, either decentralized autonomous organization that is running the protocol or just company that is running the protocol, you can issue a tokens which will incentivize uh, the, the, the agents of the whole market. So we can incentivize the asset providers to provide assets to the systems, right? To make sure that in your system there are more assets than in the other one. You can incentivize clients to make a market in the tokenized ecosystems, and you can incentivize acquirers to acquire such assets and consume them. For example, through lowering fees or giving some, um, some, some bonus tokens. So as I mentioned, we need to consider like three things, which is technology, uh, economy, and, uh, and law. And when it comes to the technology, as you can see, like the web-free gaming is not only blockchain and it's not only NFT. It's totally different moving parts that no one is talking about yet, uh, which I do believe is really important. When you look at it from the technical side, from uh, the web-free stack is, consists of a couple of layers. So the layer zero is networking layer. It's out of the scope of this of this discussion. Doesn't really matter for for the gaming now. Uh, layer one is where blockchain blockchains are, and uh, here we can find the blockchains and also some data distribution protocols, uh, like for example IPFS, which is how the data is stored in a decentralized way, and. What is happening, in my opinion, that is the. Um, kind of hurting the, the, the industry in both ways is that when it comes to the discussions about the web free and gaming, the whole discussion is about layer one. And obviously there are many problems with layer one, like Ethereum that is uh, not scalable, that is uh, too expensive when it comes to transactions. So that's, that's fair, this is how it is, but then there is layer two. And on the layer two, there are many, many solutions already uh, proven to work that are uh, solving the challenges that were already faced on the layer one. So two most uh, important from them are the, uh, are the layer two uh, scaling solutions, um, so uh, rollups, which uh, solves, like ZK rollups or optimistic rollups, which solves the scalability issue and uh, expensive transaction issue. This is already in place. And they are, there are oracles that are um, allowing possibility of connecting the on-chain data uh, with the off-chain off -chain world. Also, what I consider in the discussions that everyone is assuming that now if you need to go to the web free, uh, like you need to do everything on, on top of the web free stack, which is not true. But going, going later with the layers, then we have like uh, APIs and languages, which is basically bridge between interface and the whole blockchain world. Then there is the user interface um, like here, MetaMask, which is wallet. And then 
there are gaming engines well, it's already possible to implement in in Unreal on or Unity uh, either connection with the MetaMask wallet that is connecting you to the uh, to the blockchain world where you can interact with either smart contracts or or the wallet addresses itself, and uh, and this is already possible. This is uh, this is already happening. So as you can see, you don't need even to. Um, like talk really about the about blockchain. You don't really need to touch the blockchain directly itself. What you can do is really even work only on the interface layer and also like on the uh, layer two uh, layer. But also, it's important to note that like you still can have web two solutions in your stack, right? I mean, that will be even recommended. If you're not creating a totally new game from the scratch, then there is not really much sense in trying to do everything in the web three world. Like the, the better approach would be to just ex expand, like um, explore maybe one specific functionality that I will give you example later on uh, in order to just test, test out the whole solution, which is uh, right now fully fully possible. Here you can see a list of the layer two solutions of, that are solving the issue of scalability of the layer one blockchains. And they are using like mainly two different technologies, which is optimistic rollup or ZK rollup. What is also important here is that some of them are even designed for games, that they, they were created typically for games use cases. So this is also what we are observing is that more and more solutions um, are trying to provide experience tailored for the uh, gaming development and also for the gamers, like trying to solve one of the biggest issues from the gamer perspective, which is user experience when it comes to setting up the uh, crypto wallet, for example. Then we have oracles. And one of the, the, the top provider and the benchmark in this field is Chaining, which is middleware that enables smart contracts to access off-chain resources. Meaning that, uh, not going to the details, like, but in the blockchain world, there is the challenge of connecting the blockchain with the off-chain data, so basically with the servers itself. And this is what Chaining is, uh, is uh, solving in a secure way. So there are different uh, the products that, that they do have, and they are also proven. But when it comes to the gaming, the, one of the most important uh, the thing related to what we can implement on the, on the blockchain itself is randomness. So the question in gaming itself, it's uh, always around randomness, around, OK, so skill versus luck, especially in the competitive space. So when it comes to randomness, we can define like two categories uh, on the like higher level. We have like input randomness, which is about um, which is randomness that occurs prior to a player taking an action, and output randomness, which is uh, which occurs after that. And if you think about the like esports, for example, stakes are really high, and because of the randomness, players may feel deceived. By, by the randomness itself and maybe suggest that someone has manipulated it because it is possible in, uh, in the way how Web2 and centralized uh, uh, systems work. With on-chain solutions, so with the blockchain itself, like Chainlink have the product of uh, verifiable randomness, which is about the fact that on-chain block data is used as an input to generate each random number and providing the result was generated fairly and for the requester. What does it mean? It means that after a game or during the game, what you can do as a player or whoever else, because this data is public, you can go and verify that randomness in the game uh, is on the on-chain and it was generated in a really proven random way. That no one could actually impact that, and the fact the input that was uh, gathered to, to generate this random number uh, was truly random. So this is, this is one of the important things here. Like, 
examples of implementation can be like really straightforward about like the loot boxes. So when we uh, when we are in the face of the game where we, for example, find some loot box and there is this randomization of what we are going to find there, it can be in uh, in NFT or not. The important part here is that the randomness is proven on chain that uh, it was done securely and no one was playing around it. And here is the use case in, in the game that already exists and that, that is just proving uh, the fact that these solutions are here, are in place, and are used. For gaming use cases, they can be like whatever is happening here right now on the field, which is like play to earn, gamify, metaverse, loot boxes, and lag based games. And here is the part also interesting stuff because, like, the, the I think the most uh, skepticism or even the hate in the in the web uh, are related to the NFTs and uh, games. And um, this is something that I will try to explain at the end of the lecture why it's uh, why the players, why the gamers not really hating uh, NFTs but something else. But this is later. With the whole discussion about the NFTs, no one is talking about dynamic NFTs. And the dynamic NFTs is something that I believe is also the um, really great fit for the games even for the actual games that we can expand on this model. So with dynamic NFTs, what it means is that you can, like, si simply put, the dynamic NFT is an NFT that can change based on external conditions. So we can change it through the internal trigger on the, uh, coming from the chain, but we can also change it from the external trigger coming from the off-chain. And if you think about it, like it can be different, many, many different implementations that we will talk um, uh, that we will talk in a minute. But what is possible? It's not only about you know just the change of the image, but the traits that, for example, your your player have. And it can be implemented like in a way where your character is progressing uh, across the game, or the NFT, like an asset, uh, or the weapon itself in the game is progressing as well through different combinations. Like, uh, for example, you can, through the game, gain some more experience, and while the experience is on a specific level, then your NFT can automatically, automatically uh, re re um, reveal new trait. Uh, and uh, also reveal new uh, new image of your of your character, uh, which was uh, before coded in into the smart contract. So no of the underlying guidelines around the fact that um, everything needs to be uh, tamper proof uh, will be broken here. Then also another example is like uh, change based on external conditions. So from the off chain. Like we can have some base athlete NFT, and then uh, when some conditions are met coming from the outside world, then uh, the, we can we can think about some uh, raffle entries and also upgrading some some NFTs here. So regarding this, uh, there is like plenty of use cases uh, from on-chain sports data, like changing avatars, prediction games, redeemable real-world items, fantasy leaks, and fan loyalty rewards. And what I'm trying to, to show to you today is that again, like web, uh, the, the gaming, it's uh, and web free. It's not only about the, the blockchain. It's not the discussion about how I can use in my game the decentralized ledger technology. You, you don't need to, right? You can pick some different parts. Like, like even here, you can pick only dynamic NFT and play around loyalty uh, rewards. You can you can pick uh, like just part of the randomization and maybe do your next lottery in your game uh, on top of the of the on chain. So this is that uh, technology that is already in place. You can use it, you can play with it, and uh, it's proven to work. And again, you don't need to think only about the blockchain or only about NFTs. There is plenty of different stuff. Then there is another part, which is economics. So we, we have this technology that enables us to uh, issue um, digital assets. And when we have digital assets, like in the real world, then their, their economics come into play. And if you think about like what economics is, it's all about incentives, punishments, and behaviors. So when we are trying to design some system and think about 
uh, how it should work. We are expecting some behaviors to happen and some behaviors to not happen. That's why we are um, designing the, uh, the rules that will incentivize around some behaviors and punish around some behaviors. And this can be done through different digital assets as well. So if you look at the evolution of the gaming monetization, and this is, I think, one of the most controversial topic right now in, uh, in, the, in the GameFi um, sector. So we have this pay-to-play era with, with games like um, GTA, Tetris, and so on. We have this revolution of free-to-play era, which is happening right now, that there are totally different monetization um, strategies than it used to be before. And we have GameFi era, which um, started not so long ago. And the problem with this is that monetization strategies are mainly around NFT sales, uh, like uh, token appreciation, uh, subscriptions, advertising, and so on. And the, the NFT sales itself, it's something that um, even I believe that is done really, really in a wrong way. Meaning that it immediately, when some game is trying to sell some NFTs, then immediately it means that they're probably trying to do some cash grab. So this is not, not the way to approach the monetization model in the, even in the web two world with, uh, with, standard, with standard gamers. And the play to earn model, which was popularized by the Axie Infinity, uh, like there was an economic success here, but it ended up uh, badly, but it ended up like everyone expected, which you can see here. So actually Infinity is a web free game where um, they introduce this or sort of, um, maybe make it more for, uh, um, familiar, the model of play to earn, where players can play in order to earn the, their tokens, but in order to play, you need to buy their tokens and so on. This is like on the on the basic layer, and as you can see, in like just a matter of really couple of months, their cumulative revenue was around 1.3 billion dollars. Uh, the 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 green the green bars are the revenue, and the violet one is price. What it shows you, it shows you that at, there was this breaking point of the fact that the play to earn economy was not able to sustain the fact and like from from the get go to uh, to sustain the fact that there at some point there will be not enough demand power in uh, in order to uh, to win with the supply so when you have like plenty of players that are playing only to to earn and you need to put far much bigger stake on the table in order to even go to the game, then this is basically what, uh, what will happen with each of the game with similar uh, tokenomics. So at the end of the day, your revenue will drop, your price of the token will drop, and uh, probably your, your game will, will be end because uh, no one uh, is going to play around that. Because they were playing only for the earning uh, the, the purposes. And a framework for the gaming monetization, like uh, even most most games, not only web free games, but in general games, if you if you if you would like to put it somehow on the on the, the on the two dimensional axis. So on one axis we have the social value. So you can sell in, sell in game assets that showcase the status or cosmetic value, but do not impact the gameplay. And uh, also there is the, um, uh, the, the, second, the second axis, which is about the utility value. So you are selling the, the asset that is actually uh, impacting the gameplay and provides the players with great competitive advantage. So like the examples here, as you can see on the, on the screen, there's like Fortnite. A uh, successful business model by selling digital skins or just cosmetic upgrades to weapons. There is Roblox, which is currently um, kind of identified as the biggest, like the metaverse. And Roblox monetizes uh, via subscriptions of Roblox, which can be spent with like variety of third-party developers built in games. And uh, games like GTA enable players to purchase items uh, to help them complete the storyline uh, faster. And there is this part of uh, 
for NFTs, the, the problems right now with like the play to earn or gamify uh, the models is that they are not able to uh, go through this entertainment threshold. Meaning that if you have this game and this game is designed from the get go just to make money, you will make this money. At the beginning, you will be incentivized uh, um, far much higher than uh, through the game because the more more players will, will be will be playing. So if at the end of the day your game is not able to provide this like entertainment like game are supposed to, um, your game is not going to, to sustain. And this is the problem in, in the web free uh, gaming industry right now, mainly because of the wrong approach to uh, the monetization models itself. So going back to the beginning, I've mentioned to you that uh, civilization is one of my uh, uh, one, of, one of the games when I spent the, the most time in, in the past, uh, one of the games that I really love. And I started this like thought experiment around, okay, how I could uh, manage to transfer the uh, civilization into the web free world. And just some kind of reminder and refresher, comparison between the closed and open world, like these are some guiding principles, like what is the difference when it comes to the structure, of the property rights, this is really important, of the data itself, access to the game, ownership, identity, and so on. This is like totally different two, um, two sides of the spectrum. And going back to this model, so we're talking about it, that this is the model of the open decentralization, where, okay, there are some gamers, we have multiple clients, we have smart contracts, user data, digital assets, and so on. So I was like, okay, so let's start with clients. Uh, let's start with this idea of, I would like to enable more developers to create some various clients on top of the civilization game engine to bring totally different crazy experience, right? And I was like, but wait, uh, there is something like that, right? That there are mods. There are mods already in different games. So I checked the, um, I checked the documentation of Civilization games, and I was reading about the mods, and I was like, okay, so there is something like that, but they are saying, like, be sure to accept the user agreement. And I was like, okay, so I forgot about legal, right? This is this third component. And I started to deep dive in this user agreement in Civilization. And what I found is something uh, like scary and funny in, in, like, in parallel. So on one hand, there is user-created content in the game. And like long time ago, gaming industry realized that like the content creators itself are really valuable for, for the game because they are creating the community, they are creating the network effect that I was talking um, uh, about before. And you would think, so if there is someone willing to invest time and skills in order to provide uh, some modification to the game, in order to provide different experience, in order to innovate on top of what you build, like he should be or she somehow incentivized, right? Well, not here. So as you can see, like, and this is only the beginning. So the, the user created content and uh, user agreement when it comes to the, um, to the civilization game that is uh, right now uh, basically says that we have all rights for your modification and you can't do nothing about it. Even if you will make money on top of it, like whatever. Like we are not going even to tell you about it, right? So this is just the way and this is also something that struck me because if I hear like um, that there are different parts of the gaming community that are against blockchain, I can understand that they, they are against that because they, they are not exposed to the, f the, the whole building blocks of the space. And when it comes to the uh, gamers that are creating content, creating mods, like I don't understand why, are, uh, why they are against blockchain when the current companies and the current model that we have in Web2 are doing something like that, right? Where in the Web3 space, it's totally opposite. It's everything about, hey, come here, do something innovative on top of our stuff, and we will even pay you uh, for that. Even before, just come to our platform, build something. If you will build something, you will get your share, right? So, so this is one of, the, uh, one of the kind of the thought I had around it. So then I was like, okay. This is user-generated content. Let's try digital assets. And oh, then it started. 
So these are like only most important screens from user agreements around uh, virtual currency in civilization game and virtual goods in civiliz civilization game, meaning all of the resources and, and the gold and so on and so on. So don't worry, you don't need to read that. I, I put the, the most funniest part. So as you can see, it, like first of all, it, when it comes to the virtual currency and virtual goods, which you can see under VC and VG, then of course, like you can use it only for exclusively within the software. Like, but that's the that's the first point. Uh, the first point. Then you acknowledge that licensor, meaning the the game developer, is able to impact the perceived value or purchase price of um, uh, of these virtual goods and currencies. And basically, everything related to the trading, selling, exchanging, whatever you can think about, is strictly forbidden. Then, what is also interesting, if you will do something about it that we find a little bit spooky, then you need to acknowledge also the fact that we can terminate, suspend, or modify your user account. And also, we can ask for it for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the application store, which is something that is not possible to happen on the web free world. This is, this is what I'm trying to say here. And these are kind of the arguments that for me, resonates with me, and on top of which I can't understand why some people, especially gamers, can be against web free world. So let's talk about user data. I was like, okay, so maybe something around user data. Maybe this is the field that we can innovate a little bit. Well, not really. And what is interesting here in the user agreement, you can find that the game developer can share your user data even with uh, governments, and also with countries that, well, you know, they have lower standards of pri privacy protection, meaning that we really don't care about your data and we are like sending it everywhere, which is again something that is not happening in the web free world. So anyway, that was the legal part. Uh, I need uh, to show the legal part on the existing solutions uh, that are really totally against gamers, totally against people that can contribute to your game, to your ecosystem. And when I was thinking, okay, so let's, let's drop it, let's really think about what would civilization game look like in Web3 that I would love to play it. And that struck me like literally this night, it was like 10, 11 uh, hours ago. And uh, yeah, just so I just tweeted about it and uh, put a screenshot. I'm showing it to you because if you are interested in joining into me in the discussion, I don't know, this it, challenge it, whatever, like feel welcome. And the case is here that imagine the civilization game, but in uh, massive multiplayer mode. Like that, that's the first really important point. The, this needs to be massive multiplayer mode. Uh, multiplayer mode, and then what you need to do, you need to pay, uh, you need to put real stake in the game, meaning you need to put real money or like cr cryptocurrency, whatever, or stable coins, and you need to put this real stake into the game in order to join DAO, which is decentralized autonomous organization. Normally speaking, it's just basically a community of people that have some ways in order to uh, decide on their budget, on their actions in a decentralized way. Basically, it all comes down at the end of the day to the voting, how are the voting rights distributed, what is the voting power, what is the way of voting, and so on and so on. So okay, we are joining the DAO, and there can be different DAOs, like the government, science, culture, army, religion, right? So everything that we have in, um, in the civilization, but it's not right now, as in normal game, uh, commanded by only you, by the single player, but each one of this specific field in one civilization is managed by different DAOs. And what does it mean? That you are playing, you are betting against not only different DAOs in different civilizations, but you are also betting against different DAOs in your civilization, which is actually what is happening in the real world as well. Right? There is like, you know, a lot of lobbying and so on and so on. So you need to put a real stake because if your DAO will win and like the winning conditions will be the same as in civilization. So for example, you, you can have science victory, you can have religion victory, you can have army victory. And if you will win, the winner's stake is all, meaning that 
you are taking all of the stakes from different DAOs, or if you will lose, well, you are losing the, the stake that you put on the, on the table. So there can be also different DAOs that, that can't win or lose the game, uh, but have impact uh, when it comes to, um, to the randomness in the game. So like barbarians or traders, we can implement here also all of the DeFi stuff. So this is something that in the massive multiplayer online mode could create huge ecosystem of different people trying to govern the best way they can their tribes in order to win the game betting against different DAOs. And I would love it. So I'm inviting you to the discussion to develop this idea further. And this is something that, this is like real screen. This is when I was doing a research for this talk. I, I, I type in why modern games and this is what, what I had. Like why modern games are bad, why modern games are boring. The modern games refers to the games that we have right now. It's not referring to Web3 whatsoever. And when I was watching, uh, watching all of these uh, videos, the people were claiming that there is uh, um, no more games created because there is like huge ghost, there is like more like um, milking the cash cow right now. Companies are only focused on, on generating revenue through, through new different ideas. And this kind of fun part of the games are um, uh, lowering down. So on one side, gamers are complaining about the modern games that they basically sucks. But on the other side, they are also complaining about the new innovative stuff that is coming in and, uh, and is trying to change that. But well, are they really complaining about that? So when you look at, of course, the, the headers, it's uh, saying that, yeah, there is a like, huge pushback from the gamers when it comes to the NFT, huge pushback from the gamers when it comes to the blockchain. But it's not the problem with NFTs of blockchain. If you really deep dive and read about it and even read the, uh, what people are saying, they are not saying that NFTs are wrong, like, or blockchain is wrong. Like, technology is, is not good or bad. Like, it's only a technology, right? But the problem is with the fact how these companies want to introduce this technology. Because basically, it's all about the fact that this is like typical cash grab. They are saying, hey, we are going to do NFT and let uh, pay, uh, pay us for it, right? Which is obviously not the case. No one, no one would like uh, um, uh, to have it. So. What's next on top of that? And there are like plenty of different, uh, the different areas and paths that gaming studios, developers, also investors can take in all of this world. But like I just wrote down a couple of the most important ones looking, uh, looking at what is happening currently on the market. And the most important thing is really forgot about cash grab. Like seriously, if if you will be like another gaming studio that is trying to uh, capitalize on some trend and so on, and you will say, hey, I'm going to uh, emit some NFT, and you want people to pay for it, then forget about it. Of course, there will be pushback for that. And it's reasonable, and I will push back for it as well. If you really want to introduce NFTs, then first of all, consider the free airdrop for your community, meaning that first evaluate like what is your community, what contribution they are doing, and uh, do the free airdrop, send it, send it to them for free as uh, some part of onboarding them on the new technology. Then consider dynamic NFTs, as I showed you before in the lecture, because the static NFTs, it's not really something, at least in my opinion, that would really change the game a lot. But when it comes to dynamic NFTs, here is the huge space to innovate. And actually, yes, like consider NFTs that really make sense, not only just because of the marketing narratives, right? And again, that are not cash grabs. And what you can also do where is the innovation area, you can incorporate a decentralized financing game. Like in Civilization that you mentioned, you can even create a decentralized exchange where players or you can be liquidity providers for different trading pairs. Like it doesn't even have to be money. It can be normal resources like coal uh, or horses, like normal meaning digital in the, in the game. And this is something where you can also be incentivized and make, uh, make fee on top of that. You can create in-game land and borrow market, which can be also interesting dynamic. In-game governance by DAOs, this is something that, at least in my mind, is at the top of the list of things that should be explored in the gaming industry, because gaming is all about the community. And 
the DAOs are the way how communities are gathered together and how they are collectively making decisions in order to fulfill some goal. So for example, you can create a DAO that will decide on the future development of the game, right? I don't know, like the gamers should be interested in that. Uh, the, most likely some of them, especially if you provide some um, meaningful incentive structure. And the, the game tokens, digital assets, can be your like, framework for balance in incentives in your market and game, and even for acquisition of the, of the new gamers. You, you can have the tool that uh, will allow you to really balance out the economics that you have in the game, uh, especially taking into account that it can have also some, um, some real financial value uh, related to that. So with that, I hope I um, convinced some of you to the fact that the, the blockchain is not the only thing that you, you should consider in terms of web-free gaming. There are plenty of different building parts and plenty of stuff to innovate here, and that the technology is ready and it's in place, that uh, the economics uh, can be innovative part of your, of your next game, of your existing game, and that, especially from the legal perspective, what's happening in the current situation in the world uh, when it comes to the games, it's uh, totally opposite that should happen for people that are contributing to your game and to your community. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs>